So I really wanted to sit down and talk with you because I really consider you amongst one of the wisest people I really know. And I've tried to kind of think about like, well, why do I consider you one of the wisest people I know? And I think above all else, it's because you seem like you've always made yourself a student of life at all times. You've never stopped learning and you've stayed open to kind of taking every experience that happens, whether it be good or bad. And as soon as it happens, trying to make sense of what is kind of the lesson or what can I learn from this? Do you feel like that's true? Absolutely. Like I think I told you earlier, I consider every experience a positive and I build that as part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've had a lot of years to kind of slowly have conversations with you, but I feel like it wasn't until more recently that I've really gotten to kind of know you and more so hear your approaches and your ideas of life and your philosophies with things like that. Because, I mean, you just went through, albeit, you know, the loss of a loved one, and it was almost immediately that you were looking at the greater wisdom of that, of, of appreciating it and seeing where you want to be with, with loving and finding the purpose of that and focusing on the positive of it. And I think that's something that us in a society now we're a lot less focused on where we want to kind of dwell in the drama and the sadness of it and kind of stay there forever and be in this poor me kind of mentality. Exactly. Well, the reason I'm not as depressed as some people are is I just have a way of appreciating the time that I did have, whether it's a relative or a friend or a pet. I've also learned that you can love your pets just as much as you love people. That I have learned. But what I want to do is put it in perspective in my life, like I do everything, just like building blocks. Information, we gather it and we send it. We're not sure who we send it to or where it all goes. But everything that's alive is sending information somewhere. Mm -hmm. And as far as my my cat, uh, like I said, I appreciate very much the time I was allowed to have with that cat. And I like to think, and I've done a lot of research, by the way, that he still exists. Like all energy, you cannot kill energy. It mm -hmm. goes somewhere. So looking at my whole life, I have to put this in perspective, too, as part of my life. Well, you know, that's, that's definitely something that because I work in hospice, and so I, I'm constantly involving my life in, in loss and loss of human beings. And beyond that, though, I will truthfully say that my my dog dying, who I had from the age of like eight to my early 20s, mm -hmm. that was harder than the loss of my mother at 12 years old, truthfully. And I understand that totally. I mean, that sounds probably crazy or callous to people like that shouldn't be true. But, you know, the love that I had with my dog was such a pure one. And he was there through the loss of my mother. And he carried me through so many things. And he was just pure positive energy for such a long period of time that it's like all I had for him was absolute love 24-7, only positivity. And I think that animals, they possess this kind of purity in them that just can't be measured or compared to. You're a popular guy. Yeah, well, <laughs> speaking of my mother, when my mother passed away, or speaking of people dying in general, relatives that you love, you love them beyond belief. But there's a certain understanding. We understand that we have to pass away. Animals don't. And we have no negatives with our animals. It's just our pure love. They don't argue with us. They don't choose sides. They just love us, no matter what we do. And that's not the same with our parents, mm -hmm. our relatives, our friends. There's always negatives involved. But I can understand people dying um, as a natural course of events. But like I said, we all know that we're going to pass. The animals don't. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I think about that. I think about how much I've cared and missed just this one little cat 
And then I think about when my mother died. I was also very upset, um, depressed. Of course, that was many years ago. I had less understanding in those days than I do now. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I compare it. Was I as sad when my mother dies? Of course, but in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I always have this. I, I have like a, a speech that I kind of give, uh, various topics, things that I say, because I work the emergency on call for hospice. So I attend a lot of the moments when a family member first passes away, and I'm the one who calls the funeral home and, and does that whole process. And I have these things that I often say to families and one of the things I always say is, me as a human being, standing here with you right now, not as a nurse, but me as a conscious human, as Dakota, who chooses to be a nurse, who chooses to be a hospice nurse, who chooses to work this job and take this role, why would I choose to do those things if I believed this was a bad thing? If I believed that someone passing was actually a negative or horrific experience? Why would I put myself and subject myself through that if I didn't really believe in this? And why would I partake in this? It's, it's not an eternal punishment to myself. It's because I find that loss and death of someone is one of the great ways to bring people together and to motivate people. If you have something in your life that you need to change, or there's something that perhaps you need to move, or you need to quit your job or go into another field. I think that someone passing away is one of the greatest tools to really make that happen in a sense that you, you can bring a lot of greatness and the loss of a loved one can really bring people together like none other. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, I'm not happy even to this day, but I do understand the way I handled my mother's death. As much as I loved her, she was in my house for the last year and being taken care of by hospice. Uh, and they were wonderful. But the night she died, I simply wasn't there, spiritually, mentally. And now I realize that was a defense mechanism mm -hmm. to save myself the pain. She wanted hospice to come that last day. She couldn't even talk. It was about uh, 5 o'clock in the evening, and all she could say was, I'm dying. And as soon as she said that, even though I knew that was true, I said, Mother, you're not dying. I said, the centennial is coming up. Mm -hmm. Christmas is just around the corner. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And then she wanted hospice, and I said, I said Mother, they're not going to do anything for you. Now, that sounds cruel. I understand that. And I acted like nothing out of the ordinary was happening. And I said, do you want me to sleep in your room tonight on the floor? At that point, all she could do was shake her head. Now, I didn't want to face it, obviously, because that's just not me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sit there holding her hand and going through hours of that grief because I couldn't handle it. So to protect myself, I simply checked out and pretended. Not pretended, actually felt that none of this is happening. And the first day, she died at 5 in the morning, or so I thought. And I got up. I went over there. I sat there. I didn't feel anything yet. And it's like she was still there. And let me tell you something. I had an old clock, an Art Deco clock, sitting in the living room. This is all when I lived in Kona, Hawaii. Well, the old clock had a, a light on it. Now, if it were AM, it would be red. If it were PM, the light would turn to green. Well, anyway, I looked at the clock, and the clock had stopped. Now, my brother, he was there. And I looked at the clock when he was sitting there, and it said 5.02 a.m. 5.02 a.m., and the light had turned to the a.m. color. Mm -hmm. So I told my brother, I'm going to reset the clock, and the clock's going to tell us something. I reset the clock. Hours later, 
This was in the late afternoon now. I looked at the clock once again, even though I had set it for the correct time, went to 5.02 a.m. And the light had changed to a.m. And I was absolutely sure when I told my brother that this clock is going to tell us something. It was like my mother telling me, no, dear, I died at 5.02 a.m., not 5 Mm a.m. Now, I was absolutely positive, and I still wasn't feeling any pain. The next day, it all hit me. Now she's gone. And I cried, and then I was ashamed at the way I treated her at the last moments of her life. And I've had to deal with that. For years, I had to deal with that until I finally came to the conclusion, don't feel guilty anymore. Not at all. I did what I had to do to protect myself. Mm -hmm. I always have to kind of tell people when someone is passing away, someone will kind of say like, they want to ask me questions, even though they know I don't have an answer. Like, oh, are they going to pass away in the next 30 minutes? I need to go to the store. Like, are are they going to pass away tomorrow? Like, Uh, I have a loved one who's coming into town or something like this. And I always say to people, you have to treat every single moment like as if someone were to pass away. And with that, move on kind of from it. Say your goodbyes. Because punishing yourself, feeling like you have to be there holding their hand at the very last second. You have to be involved in that. And anything short of that, you failed. It's like... You could spend hours, days, months next to their side and then just have the one time where like you leave the house and they pass away. And people kind of see those types of things as a failure, but I see it more so like maybe their soul left their body as a favor to you to kind of do it at that time, to not have you suffer at those moments. Everything really happens in those times as they should, as they're supposed to. Correct. Everyone has so much regret. Uh, at those times, because I know for me, with the nature of how my mom passed away, that I was just not there for her in the ways that I should. I was only 12 years old, so it's very difficult. But regardless, though, as I grow up, I even have more regrets. It's like I should have said I loved her more. I should have been by her side more, comforted her more. But those are all the things that now I see as those are lessons. And I see it now that I will live with no regrets. If I were to die, at this very moment, there's no one in my life who I feel like I need to say I love you to or I'm sorry to. Everyone knows how I feel about them in the truest, most full form of my heart. And trying to approach that, I think, has brought me personally a lot of peace. And it's what allows me to continue to do this job and have the same conversation and uh, talk about these same topics over and over and over again. And it doesn't wear me down. It it only reinforces me in wanting to be deeper into it and be more involved into it. You mentioned something earlier about the idea of like how we are all energy. And I think that plays a lot into, you know, talking about this idea of the clock because it sounds esoteric. You know, so many people will kind of hear those stories of of these kind of mystical moments, these very spiritual moments in these final times. And they'll take, and a lot of people kind of take it with a grain of salt or they don't take it very seriously. But having done this job long enough, those types of things have happened so often, Mm -hmm. so many times, constantly happening. I mean, I, I had a caregiver come to me when, when I had a patient who was on their deathbed and the caregiver came to me and said that the patient had told, asked them questions about a certain item that was relevant to the caregiver's like childhood diary, like something that there's no way they could have known about. And they were there at that moment because when people are in their deathbed, they don't, you know, they might ask for someone who's in the room to hold their hand or reach out or something like that sometimes. But really, who are they in a dialogue with? Who are they calling out for? They're calling out for their parents. They're calling out for people who are deceased. And it's clear that they have, you know, a foot in the other side, you know, a foot in another door, because we are all just energy. We're all form of 
atoms, and molecules that are mostly comprised of empty space that are held together by some unknowable essence of some type of force that bonds them together. And so when you accept more so that this physical world is not the real world, that, that really we are just a world of energy, those types of moments you can take into your heart a little better. They make a little bit more sense. And you can accept this world, I think, a little bit more for what it is once you kind of put yourself in that mindset. I couldn't agree more. And I do, absolutely, from the things I've had, the things I've experienced. I believe in a soul or a spirit, if you want to call it that. Some people like to say the soul is just your body and your thinking process, and the spirit is separate, like something that guides us or hovers over us. I don't know any of that to be true. It could be. But I absolutely do believe in after life. Mm -hmm. um, just like with the clock. And by the way, the clock never worked again. <laughs> it after, just broke after that. After that moment. And I was thinking energy, which brings me to another <laughs> subject. There were photos of my mother, old photos, where there was like a perfect lightning bolt in front of her. Now, I knew of three such photos. Several months after she had passed away, and this sounds a little offbeat, maybe, but several months later, something happened to me where I ended up in emergency. Something in my throat, which almost cut off my breathing completely. Well, when I got out of the hospital and I was home, I had a vision or a dream while I was sleeping or in a vision state. And there was multitudes of people, and my mother was standing next to me. And she said, there are four photos, dear. There's another one with an electric bolt in front of me. Now, I've yet to find that fourth one, but I'm sure it exists. Also, in that same dream, out of that multitude of people, someone yelled out, I know your Uncle George. Well, my Uncle George was a, uh, a doctor, bone therapy especially. In fact, he invented the first artificial knee made out of some kind of plastic and filled with water and was on TV about that, explaining the process years ago, him and another doctor. And the fact that someone would yell out, I know your Uncle George, while well, she's telling me there are four photos. And that was so real, absolutely real. She was right next to me. Not that I saw her with eyes that we see in this lifetime or heard her say those in words that we perceive in this lifetime. It was all mental, mm -hmm. a mental language so precisely clear. And that's happened to me more than once. It's interesting how many people have confided in me over, you know, over my career and over just conversations that I've had with people about my own loss and about these things. No one wants to like get out there necessarily and share these types of stories sometimes because people are so quick to dismiss it. Correct. But I mean, so many people have stories like this and have experiences like this. How are we to dismiss all of it? How are we to just not acknowledge that whatsoever? In fact, like in my own family, we have this uh, photo. So my grandfather, he was the eldest of like seven or eight kids or something like that. And his father was the head of, you know, this big farm that's out in West Virginia. It's a giant Southern Baptist family. And so this whole family there, it, my great grandfather, so my grandfather's father, he passes away. And they have a funeral and then a picnic out on the edge of the woods. And there's this photo of all of the family, every single person who was there at the funeral, who was at the picnic. And then in the back far right corner is the black silhouette of a figure in the shape, in the suit, in the stature, in the posture, in the height, everything of my great grandfather there, right there in the photo. And every person who was there is accounted for in the photo. And yet there's that black figure there. And, you know, this is in like the 
tens, maybe twenties of West Virginia of just a black and white old photo. And, you know, these people aren't making up this story. They're not, they have nothing to gain. They're, there's not, they're not sitting there, my family, doctoring this. And so many people have these things. And yet, I think people just using like the word ghost or spirit kind of turns a lot of people off. But I see it like, what better way, What? how do we kind of identify this concept that the energy and the imprint that our physical body has clearly has a non-physical form. It clearly possesses some sort of whatever you want to call it, spirit, soul, mind, consciousness, something. There is something non-physical attached to it. Because I mean, we can go back tens, hundreds of thousands of years. How come when a human being dies, other human beings put like a, a headstone, put like a marker in the ground and to signify this is where a human's body is? Why do they do that? Other species don't do that. That's correct. And I've never understood all the ritual that goes into funerals and all the rest of it. It's nice for the people who have been left behind. But I've, I've always thought the physical is worth hardly anything compared to the soul or spiritual. Mm-hmm. Once someone's gone, they're gone. The body just becomes, well, dirt and water. That's all there is. So I've never really believed all the uh, the rituals, etc., that go along with people when they die, or animals when they die. Some people have ashes for memories, I guess. They're not there. The physical is gone. So I like to still communicate, but in a spiritual way with mm-hmm. those who have passed. And I do. I try. And that's all we can do. I guess we're not going to know until we get there. But I know there's a lot more going on with physics, quantum physics, quanta being the smallest particle. I will say this, and this is another thing I don't tell many people, but I have actual proof because I've told people in advance of certain things that I see. I'll just give you one example. When I was living in Riverside, California. I was with my lady friend, and we had woken up in the morning, and I told her about a very precise dream I had. I said we were at some kind of a park, and we were all sitting at benches. There was a lot of people, mostly older people. I even described some of the ones sitting across from me that I was talking to. And then there was a display area in my dream or vision where I saw a photograph, number of photographs, but the one that stuck out most was a bunch of soldiers. I don't know, probably from World War I with the kind of hats they wore, the kind of uniforms they had. And there was about probably 24 faces and uniforms on this one photo. Then I also described that I saw trains in the water, partially buried in water. And then I said I saw tables full of old phonographs, the kind that had the big horn Mm -hmm. protruding. All right, we talked about that a little. About an hour later, she got a call from her aunt, fairly elderly, and she says, we're having a get-together, a reunion in a park in Colton. Colton is adjacent to Riverside. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, let's go. We go. We sit down at one table. I'm also, I'm already feeling, my gosh. We sit down. There's the people I described to her sitting directly across from us. I said, let's go to the display area. The first thing we come to is the photo I described to her with the soldiers. Oh, by the way, I also was in the vision. I had told her, I said, they're all dead. So we walk up and the first photo is the one of the soldiers. It's right there in front of us. And I looked at her and I said, they're all dead. Now she kind of freaked out. We continued to go and there's big photos of trains submerged in water. We go a little further. There's all the tables full of old phonographs. Well, she was just beside herself. 
And I was like, oh my gosh. So talk about quantum physics. Now that's just one example. I've had many, and I've told people in advance. I could go on with them if you want to hear any more of them. Well, but you know. how do you possibly... What I did was go into the future. How does that happen? This was precise. Every little detail. Well, you know what's interesting about this topic in particular is this is something through that, like all of mankind, tens, hundreds of thousands of years, was very readily accepted. This idea of oracles or prophecies or being in tune with what I would describe. And I, I'm a big believer, like you were talking about, the soul, conscious, whatever. I think we're all oftentimes talking about the same things, but calling it different things. What I would describe as like the ethereal, like, essence of like this flow that kind of goes through existence in itself rather it be the yin and the yang or the chi or some sort of energy there is like a some sort of uh non-physical like stream of um consciousness and energy that flows through all of life in some form and that was a very accepted idea throughout all of history not until very 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 recently did we start dismissing these ideas of saying like, oh, well, they're not founded in science. And now here we are, we come, you know, a bit more recently and we move into the field of quantum mechanics. And I was just reading about how this like big scientific prize that goes out, one of the runner ups, not even the person who won, but one of the runner ups proved not like a theory, but apparent, I don't know how this is possible, proved the idea of like other realities and other streams of consciousness exist within our own and occupy space smaller than the width of a strand of hair. And it's like, I'm not even smart enough to understand even the most basic fundamentals of what they could possibly be talking about. And yet these are such crazy ideas that science is arguing like, oh no, these are provable. So to me, this idea of there's clearly a flow. There's there's a, a stream of information and consciousness that kind of flows throughout all of existence. Is not that abstract of an idea. Maybe we just haven't quantified it in, in in pure numerical terms in a sense. But how many times have you thought about someone and then got a call from them? How many times have you just had a feeling that you would run into someone or you thought of something or someone and then you just suddenly saw it or you ran into them or something like that? I mean, how do you quantify that? How do you explain that without some sort of belief that there is some form of impact of this magnetism and energy that exists within all of consciousness that has a clear impact on the world around us? It clearly has an intertwinedness to it. It's not just a separate crazy idea or something like that. Well, it brings into question, is the future already there? And we are just passing through what is already there. It's kind of like that phrase, there's nothing new under the sun. I feel that mankind doesn't invent. I think that he just discovers what is already there, what's coming. And after all, the greatest scientists in the world, these ideas come to them and they're almost required to follow that pattern where is this leading there's some influence directing them mm -hmm. directing them to the future if you invent a toaster where did that come from you can say well one plus one equals two we have electricity we can do this did we do, did we invent that or are we just passing through what already is there? Mm -hmm. We invent nothing. Yeah, so, no. so when that famous statement, there is nothing new under the sun, may be very true. Yeah, I, well, I've always liked the idea of, you know, are things, are things like invented, created, or are they just kind of discovered? Like, for instance... Discovered. Um, yeah, because, I mean, mathematics, these ideas, they're already there. Correct. It's just a matter of us kind of seeing them. And, exactly. And if anything else, I guess in a way, 
us advancing as a civilization in a spiritual and an intellectual um, form as beings, advancing enough and evolving in our own natural process through time for us to quantify and comprehend the things that were already around us in a sense. I always look at it like this. Long ago, there were creatures, the early stages of life crawling around on the bottom of the ocean on and these simple organisms on earth and they didn't possess like eyeballs we we find these fossils of these ancient creatures that don't even have eyeballs Correct. they don't even have the sensory organs to comprehend vision but light was always there Correct. there was always something to physically see but they didn't have the organs they didn't have the things necessary to process it and see it and so as time has gone on They've grown these, the, we, we grow and adapt and we form into what is now our mature human sense just to comprehend the things around us. Like, um, I think it's like birds. They're able to see certain colors and wavelengths of light that we just can't. We know it's there. We, there's so many things around us in the physical world that we just lack the sensory organs to even comprehend or hear or see or experience but it doesn't mean that they're not there so then the question though is like it shows that there are infinite layers to this existence and a lot of those things are not in obvious physical form it's kind of like uh, electricity was seen as like black magic until now we just say like oh well those are just that's just electricity like it's 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 been simplified to the point where it's like we're not even impressed by it anymore and yet at the same time, the things that still mystify us, we see as like, oh, well, you know, that's just not true because we just haven't proven it yet or we haven't comprehended it and quantified it yet in a sense. But to me, it doesn't make it any less real. I mean, these are real things people are experiencing, yes. real things that people are going through in their lives. Absolutely. Um, we're on our own little world, and in some ways we have to be at least for right now, we're in the physical world, but we have a hint that there's many more things going on than what we see, feel, smell, etc. Mm -hmm. That's all just physical and very basic. Mm -hmm. But energy is limitless. Anything is possible. Absolutely anything, if you think about it. Um, I would like to say... Some of the things I see are frightening. And I'll just give one more example. In Kona, Hawaii, on 9-10, I had a disturbing dream. I was in a big city, and there was a big bull, pretty immobile, on the sidewalk. And that terrified me. And then up the street, something horrible, horrible was happening. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't have any clue whatsoever. And then this person, I'll call him a person, came up to me and said, Dennis, you'll just have to accept this. There's nothing you can do about it. Again, I told my lady friend about that at the time. I said, I had a really bad dream. There's this big bull. And I went on, and I, I said, told the dream. The next day, I go out and get the paper, and on the front page is a big picture of a big bull on a sidewalk. And the World Trade Centers had been bombed. So again... There's one that I told somebody in advance. Something that I've, I've thought about and I've talked with some other people before about is right now, as we look at the world in a, as a whole, as we go through a global pandemic, a lot of people acknowledge the fact of like 2020 in particular, how depressed everyone was. People weren't able to do the things that they loved everyone as a whole was a bit more depressed. It's like the world as an entirety, and it's still going on, of this level of just sadness. And we we kind of became this collective consciousness. And it's undeniable to me that like, you can feel the 
the sadness in the air and you know everything that's gone on politically you could feel like the anger you could feel the, the tension I, I feel like if you if you can't acknowledge that there are clear energies I mean th- I look at it like this when someone who is comes into your place of business or comes towards you and they're obviously carrying themselves with a lot of hostility and they make you uncomfortable what have they actually maybe physically done sometimes you can just feel the energy of people you might walk by and know like oh that's a very pleasant person that's a very warm person or that's a very angry person and it's not necessarily like you can't equate it's just like oh because of the face that they made or what they were wearing that has nothing to do with a lot of times it's just an energy you can feel off of it there are these clear energies and these these ethereal essences that that you know bind and flow through this existence and the acknowledgement that this is just a physical world and nothing more i feel like leaves you with having to explain more if anything than just accepting the fact that there are many things that we just have not fully comprehended as spiritual beings in our on in our own existence and tried to make sense of in a sense because we're so we moved into this new philosophy probably around the time of perhaps like Rene Descartes where we separated from the eastern school of idea where in a lot of medicine they'll treat things spiritually as well as they will physically Correct. and only more recently did we move to where it's like no nope, only physical exists there that's it there's nothing more to it because i mean we know that stress causes cancer and we know that that your mentality has an impact on your neuroplasticity of how your brain works and it has these impacts and perhaps we don't necessarily need to always have like a scientific hard fact explanation for everything to just acknowledge what is kind of obviously true through the period of your own heart in a lot of ways these things that we can all recognize are all around us and constantly happening but we just can't explain it in you know, numerical, quantifiable terms. But to me, it doesn't make it less real, really. Well, I think that life goes on. Um, if all we had was the physical aspect of this earth, what reason would you want to live for? We're always looking for a hopeful, bright, beautiful future. Some people like to call it heaven or nirvana or or all the rest of it. I think that we inherently know that there's a lot more out there. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to go on. What difference would it make if you go out and become a mass murderer or rob a liquor store or the rest of it? If there's nothing to look forward to, there's truly nothing. Mm -hmm. Life would be nothing. And I don't understand a lot of people. They walk around in life, I can only say spiritually, or soulfully dead. Mm -hmm. They don't see anything beyond what they can see, touch, and feel. They laugh at anybody who claims different. And it's like two different species to me. Yeah, no, to me it's undeniable that there are people who we coexist with. And, and, you know, I I don't ever want to promote the idea of, like, people being some people being lesser than others necessarily but i find it undeniable that there is a sense of spiritual void in a great deal of people oh, people who you you just can't reach spiritually i mean correct i had someone actually ask me is there anyone who or is there a particular type of person or something you wouldn't have on this project and, and on this podcast and i said basically people who have created a million veils over their own heart where they um, they don't open their heart up. They're not willing to explore themselves or take a look at themselves and reflect on themselves and acknowledge kind of the spiritual side and the deeper side of existence in itself. Because I think it's undeniably true what you said, this idea of if there's only just the literal physical world, there's nothing more to it why not just go out and steal and murder and do those things? It's clear that within us all, rather you follow a religious guideline or rather you follow, you know, some sort of spiritual blueprint in some way, I'm a true believer that through the the purity of your own heart, by just taking a 
deep, deep reflection of what you feel in your heart, the warmth you feel when you do something good for someone, when you give someone a gift and you, and you do something very loving for them. And that feeling of anguish when you do something very bad to someone and you really hurt them and you you acknowledge what it is that you did to them and you think about how you would feel. That to me, you don't necessarily have to abide by any cosmology or theology of any kind to know like those are just universal truths. Those are just things that we can all come to the conclusion of that it's wrong to murder. You know, things like that. Correct. And that and yet you have something like the Ten Commandments, which people falsely term as religious, actually, they're all just common sense. Mm -hmm. Don't kill. What's the matter with that? Why is that being taken down everywhere? Because it's Judeo-Christian? What does that matter where it comes from? Don't kill means don't kill. Don't steal means don't steal. Those aren't religious concepts. That is a way for humanity to get along in this world with each other. You've mm -hmm. got seven billion people. You've got seven billion universes going. And we try to get along. It's funny you say that because this is something I'm always thinking about. Because for me and my generation, how I grew up, there's a, we're probably the, the big generation that's really criticized and explored this idea of deviating from being religious, especially if you look at the world, the nature of countries and things like that, and how religious they were until very recently, where we have a generation who's kind of more so making the, um, deciding to be more secular. And so I think I grew up with that mentality where I was judging, admittedly, I was judging religions with a sense of prejudice, where yeah. I was going off of the the religious followers, but not the actual religion, the content of the text and the religion. Like I, I would see it like, you know, like what, like what you say is like, what of the 10 commandments do people really fundamentally disagree with? They're overall, they're ideas that are trying to promote peace and prosperity. And yes. especially at the time of the people who they were said to, these were people who needed to hear these things that did not think that murder or raping and pillaging was wrong in any form. They were people who had to be hard told, like, listen, you guys need to be told these 10 things straight up and yes. have these drilled into your head. Yes. And so I see it like, to me, religion, and you can call a lot of things religion, you, you, can, you don't have to be religious or follow a religion even, but I just see it like a religion, what what it is, is it's just a blueprint of choices. It's it's an idea of like, these are the beliefs I'm going to abide by. You know, your religion could just be like, I'm an atheist, but I have these ideas. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to murder. I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to back by it, do these various ideas. And that to me is just simply what religion is. I think we're very caught up in this idea that a religion is the people who are members of the religion. <laughs> That's not necessarily true to me, because if you no. judge things off of that, if because I mean, truly, in essence, when you look at like the Buddha, you look at Christ, Moses, like what of the things they kind of literally did when you really are able to find the fragments of the things they really did say, they are overwhelmingly good wisdoms and, and ideas of prosperity and peace and promoting good things that were meant to kind of better the world. Now, you can't judge it off of the followers necessarily, but you're responsible for the condition of your own soul. Correct. Judge it off of yourself, truly, like your own interpretation of these things and how you think someone should act if they really followed these things. You really can't focus too much on saying like, well, I know someone who follows this religious prophet, but they don't do those things. And it's like, right, but they don't do those things. So look at the teachings and why don't you follow them? Well, I think it all boils down to love and truth. I kind of look at truth as pure love. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of truth in this world. As you said about people putting veils over themselves, uh, 
a lot of people live a lie. Their whole life is a lie. And that's all based on fear. Fear of what? I don't know. I guess each person has to figure out what his fears are. Mm -hmm. I believe corely at my, my, um, at the essence of who I am, that truthfulness is the foundation of all virtues. And I, I believe that's undeniable, and I'll, I'll die on that hill. Yeah. Well, I've always thought about churches, synagogues, temples, etc. I believe most people, and maybe this is a little prejudice, I don't know, I distinguish churchgoers from people who truly believe. I think many people sit in church, and it means nothing. It means nothing. They hear the music, they hear local events, etc., and they hear their 10-minute sermon. They're out of there, and they think that's all they have to do. They don't have to be religious. They don't have to be spiritual. They just have to go to church, and somehow they're completely forgiven with everything. Mm -hmm. Now, if you truly believe, your life is going to be a reflection of your beliefs. Not just going to church, that's not going to save you from anything. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying there? Well, you know, I'm a big believer that what your religion should mean to you, and I use that word religion, your spiritual beliefs, your blueprint, whatever you want to call it, don't get hung up on the vocab, but whatever your religion is to you, whatever your blueprint that you use to navigate with your human body as you go through this existence and this reality, whatever series of choices guide you from minute to minute to day to day basis, I think whatever you abide by, you have to stop and you have to look at those ideas and think, are my beliefs something I go around and tell people what I believe or are they things I literally do? Because I think you should abide by your teachings. You should abide by the things you believe in, not necessarily preach them. You shouldn't prophetize these ideas. You shouldn't go around telling everyone like, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I think it's best put those things into action in yourself. And if those things make you a better person, if they find they make you have better peace, they make you treat other people and people look at you and they say, hey, that's someone who's happy, who has a lot of wisdom, who has qualities I admire, then people will inquire into what do they believe that allows them to be that person? At which point, you know, I think is an appropriate time to kind of talk about the fundamentals of what you believe, but to just get on and just tell people what to do is to me in no way abiding by a religion. And abiding by a religion to me is putting it to action, being those things, walking, you know, walking the walk instead of just talking the talk, well, I guess, to put it simply. Correct. It's like um, what was said about faith is dead unless you act on your faith. Mm -hmm. If you don't act on it, you're just a mouthpiece for a church or a synagogue or a temple, whatever. Uh, you're just a mouthpiece. What you have to do is live according to your beliefs. Now, some people have no beliefs, none whatsoever when it comes to spirituality, religion, etc., anything. I guess their beliefs are one political party or this country or that country. And they don't see any further than that. These folks are stuck. They're stuck in the physical. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more to life. And sometimes I can't understand nations making wars on nations, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of things that go on in this world. Do you realize this earth is probably, oh, I don't know, less than a trillionth of a dust speck in relation to the universe? Mm -hmm. And yet, everyone is sitting here wanting to be king, king of the mountain, mm -hmm. <laughs> etc. My gosh, <laughs> can't they see that? I think a, a humbleness, grounding yourself in like what role you play, even if you were king of earth your whole life. Of a dust you know, speck. Yeah, yeah this, this planet could be hit by a meteor and struck out in one second, and mm -hmm. everything we've ever done everything we've ever worked towards and the things you thought mattered mm. and you spent your life on and the generations of it, they could disappear just like that. Just and all like trace that. of it. 
But, you know, I'm not saying you should concern yourself with a nihilistic view of just kind of going through life like, ah, oh, nothing matters, it could disappear. But it's like, you should see it like, hmm, nothing matters. Everything could disappear, so why not just make the most of it? Don't dwell so much on the importance of one own self, in a way. Yeah, that's correct. Um, speaking of a dustbeck, that too is relative. Do you realize, people say that space goes on eternally. There's no end to it. That's how small we are. However, space also goes inward. There are little teeny microscopic animals that we don't see, we don't even acknowledge, but they're there, mm -hmm. living a full life in a very, very, compared to us, small world. Now, what are these creatures made out of? What is anything that small made out of? Other things. And those things are made out of other things. Mm -hmm. So size-wise, we're dead center in the middle of everything. Space goes inward exactly as far as it goes outward. Yeah. Forever, which puts us dead center in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. Which means that everything is in the middle of everything. Have you yeah. ever, ever thought that? Well, there's... I want to say the word is zenith for um, zenith arrow. I could have the word wrong. It's a um, it's a paradox, a uh, very old philosophy. And the idea is, when you draw the bow back and you have the you knock the arrow in the bow, and right before the bow is about to release the arrow and it's traveling to its set point, the amount of space between the point of the field tip of the of the arrow and the target it's going towards the amount of space between it is theoretically infinite because let's say we let's say it's uh, one yard between like uh, just a very short distance between it we cut that in half and then we can say how many feet that is mm. and then we cut that in half we can say how many inches and we cut that and how many millimeters and we cut that for eternity yeah, and that goes on for eternity. It's just kind of like if you look at the, you look at the atoms that comprise this microphone or my human body or anything. We can take it, we can divide it down into elements, divide it into atoms, divide it into subatomic particles, into quarks, and you can continually divide that down. Correct. Just like how you can infinitely go out, and you can do this both directions at all times. So, no, I, I think about that a lot. And I think that that type of thinking is very important to the humbleness and the understanding of your station, that you could be just that speck, you could go that other way, but you're right where you are. You're right where you are in existence, exactly as you should be exactly as you are. There's everything smaller, and everything larger. Mm -hmm. And that's true of every single speck mm -hmm. that there is. And we may never reach. Well, in fact, we never will reach a yeah. zenith or a nadir as far as that concerns. Yeah, because I, I think in something we kind of talked about before is we have this fixation on if we do not dumb, I, I want to say dumb something down, like electricity into such a simple form as just saying electricity mm -hmm. instead of like magic of some type. Hey, right. If we can't do that, we just dismiss it as not real in a sense. Like if we can't quantify, understand like why people are having the experiences they are, why the, the kind of mystical, mysterious things of life happen to them. If we can't quantify those things, then they're just might as well be make-believe. But the thing is, is how could we ever expect to comprehend the idea of infinitely going down and infinitely going up in size, space, and quantum physics in itself? If, if we can't ever comprehend that, we know it's not comprehensible. Mm -hmm. Like It's kind of like, you know, despite the fact that the universe is in one sense described as infinite, but then in the other sense, they talk about how the amount of 
stars and the amount of like electrons or particles in, in various senses can be quantified in certain numbers. But then it's like, there are numbers that obviously exist that are bigger. These numbers exist that are bigger, like take like a Google, that's an actual number, what the website is named after. But there's nothing in existence that's representative of a Google. Because if you were to take all of the most subatomic micro you know, particles that we're able to discern, and we were to com calculate and combine how many we project exist, it would not be as many as numbers that we have imaginarily made up that represent essentially nothing. There's nothing that exists that is as high of a number as numbers that do exist. And so this type of thinking, I think it, it can be overwhelming for people, but right, I think well, it brings a humbleness to us. Correct. We boiled it all down with a little phrase called the nth power. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's as far as you can go. Yeah, no, it, yeah. Well, so with all that in mind and all these intense and scary <laughs> big universe <laughs> things in that, what things kind of bring you peace from a day-to-day -day basis or kind of grant you, you know, solidarity as you go through your life? Well, day-to-day, -day, I like to fill my days. Um, simple things like keeping your physical together, like going to the gym. That's a positive for me. It means on the worst day, I've done something positive. And sometimes I have some bad days. But I still made it to the gym. That's a positive. Uh, at home, I busy myself doing gardening work. I love it. There's a lot of it. I've got a house that I take care of and expand on. Those things make me happy. Reading, I love to read every day. Always learning. I mean, what we are, we're a finite body with a eternal soul. That's mm -hmm. how I truly believe. And I do read spiritually. I read my Bible, and I get a lot out of that. There's so much truth in that. I'm sure there is in, in every great religion. When you finally see what the crux of people are trying to tell you with their various religions, there's a lot of good in that. And that sustains me also to a big degree. Let's just say I'm a believer. I won't mm -hmm. put a religion on it. Uh, I'm just a believer. Do you know that these great people like Buddha said, no, I'm not a god. Jesus Christ told us about God as much as he could. And what better people to follow than these spiritualists? Mm -hmm. Now, you can call it religion. I don't like that word. I don't like that word at all. Like I said, I'm always trying to get the truth. And to me, truth is where you find love. I think love is a great cohesion of this entire universe. And we have to recognize that a lot more. Put your prejudice aside. When you see people that don't agree with, don't hate them, try to understand where they're coming from in their world, or the seven billion little worlds that are on this world. And you've got to respect them. That doesn't mean you can't call them out on things. You can only try. So instead of putting them down, just let them know what your truth is. That's all we can do. Mm -hmm. And hope and pray that it sticks with some people. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's one of the things I try to aim for a lot with this project is this idea of people with different mentalities, backgrounds, and uh, spiritual beliefs, whatever you want to kind of approach it as, and finding this harmony of how do we have these dialogues and these conversations and realizing that if you peacefully speak with one another, we can productively talk about these things and oftentimes talk about the same things. So is there any wisdom or advice you feel like took you a long time in your life to come about that you wish you had realized earlier or you would tell a pre like a prior you perhaps i used to be pretty cold pretty hard up till about the age of 32 and then i had a call it an epiphany um once again i don't want to uh, divide everything up into religions but this happened to me i was very down on everybody's beliefs 
spiritual. I was purely physical. And I was angry. I was never satisfied. Something missing. But one day, I was just sitting there watching TV. And this is how it was related to me. To me. And I don't ask anybody else to follow me or what I've been through or agree. I was watching TV, and it was just a commercial, but there was a cross in the commercial. And I looked at that, and it was like a lightning bolt had hit me. I saw everything differently from that day on. Everything. I would go through communities and see the culture of man, etc. And I could not stop learning. I wanted to know everything. I picked up a Bible. Oh, I used to despise the Bible. My sister and her family had gone Christian. And I thought, well, they're gone. I used to talk to my brother about that. Well, we lost my sister and her family. And then suddenly, like a lightning bolt, like I said, it came to me. I could not put that Bible down, that book that I hated, rejected. Thought it was leading everybody into some kind of a false security. I couldn't put it down. And people could see the change in me. I was at work, and I worked for the gas company at that time. And one of the guys, we had morning meetings all the time. One of the guys across the table said, what is it with you? It's like you're glowing. And I didn't know how to respond to that. I just said, oh, nothing. I'm just feeling great today. But I've never pushed this on anybody. I don't think anybody should. Like we said earlier, just be an example. Be an Mm -hmm. example of what you believe. What things, when you had that moment from 32, you talked about how you changed very much completely. Do you, can you think of any examples of like what things specifically you changed or things about you that maybe changed? Well, I had a battle. I used to drink at that time in my life. I used to smoke cigarettes. I immediately stopped smoking cigarettes. Not that I didn't go back to them for a while. It, it's a, you've heard the expression, fight the good fight. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be perfect. You do your best to follow what you think is perfect. What is beautiful? What is loving? You do your best for that. But this world, it occupies your mind with the many school things that are not important in the long run. They're not important. And we put all of our energy into things that mean nothing. I think that was the, biz- the big change. I, everything meant something to me from that point on. Not that I became perfect. No, I was just trying to follow who is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you mention things that helped you change spiritually and developmentally. You refer to, as you cite physical changes, like habit changes and things like that, because I think that there is a clear intertwine between our habits and our practices, what we physically do, the actions that we take, and it's not just necessarily a mindset or an adaptation of new beliefs or, or moral guidelines that we just hold in our head, but it's, it's undeniably that you have to take on certain physical performances. And, and I think oftentimes taking the bad, the things that you feel like are a detriment to you spiritually, and taking those out oftentimes is as good as adapting some good spiritual practices in a lot of ways, truly. So if you were to summarize you know, in in a simple sense of like, maybe a handful of ideas or beliefs, just moral wisdoms. Think of it like, you know, you see a a young kid down on his luck and, and he's going off to start his life and you have to kind of give him some advice of like, here's things I believe, like certain values or virtues or qualities you think are best to abide by. What sort of things would you think you would identify? Well, I would tell everybody to stop your emotions if you hear something, if you see something, and it makes you very angry, etc., that somebody else is doing 
I would say, first of all, try to find out where they are coming from, you see, and have some empathy. After all, we're all different, and we're all trying to aim for the same thing. People do it in very, very different ways, except for those who think that it's okay to trample on everybody or to kill, steal, etc., etc. That's why I said it was like two different species here on Earth. Mm -hmm. One has a capacity to grow beyond just what they see, feel, experience um, in the physical. I would tell people to open up their minds, listen to everybody, and go from there before the emotions. Don't let the emotions drag you down because when you do that, you're no better than them. Or you haven't grown very much, not as much as you thought you had grown. And mm -hmm. I still get angry when I hear people saying things politically with, with such blatant hatred, whatever side. I'm not saying one side or the other or any sides. I'm just saying we've got to listen to each other, find out why you feel that way, and then bring them an alternative. People have done that with me, and it's worked. Sometimes I just hear a phrase, and I said, oh my, okay, yeah, I got to follow that. That's correct. Do you understand what I mean here? I was very fortunate in my life. I got to give a best man speech for a dear friend of mine at his wedding, and the thing that I focused on the speech and what I centered it around was I told a brief overview of a story about how when I was in high school, I was very angry. I was um, a mean person in a lot of ways. I carried myself with a great deal of hate. Me too. And I pushed a lot of people out of my life. And there was a point in time when my best friend said to me, he sat me down and he basically kind of lectured me about like how he didn't like certain things about me and how I was acting and behaving and stuff like that. And it took me a very long time to comprehend this rather simple idea is when someone criticizes you, they're either criticizing you because they're trying to make you feel bad or because they want you to actually change. And you have to kind of learn to tell the difference because it takes a great deal of effort for someone who loves you to take the time and the risk and the energy to invest into you enough to criticize how you're behaving. And they're doing these things from a place of love, even if it's harsh to hear and even if it hurts or even if you disagree, you have to understand they're trying to express that your behavior is not making them feel good and they're trying to get you to at least acknowledge that or so. And so I think reflecting on that wisdom and that lesson and that idea of putting myself in other people's shoes, following the golden rule of trying to see the world through other people's eyes and, and make my own approaches with these things and understand what people actually are trying to really help you and what things do you need to not necessarily, you know, put your fingers in your ears and just say like, oh, I'm not listening to this. I'm not, I'm not going to hear it. Like you should listen to everything. Even if you know it's wrong, you should hear it out and you should at least give it some time to think about where various things are coming from. It's like, even if someone maliciously, you know, you, you get bullied or made fun of for a certain behavior or a certain thing or something like that, even those things are perhaps worth kind of exploring and understanding, like, is it a flaw with myself? Is it something that I have control over? Is it something I should stick with and not change? And But you should at least have that dialogue in your head, regardless of the outcome or regardless of the delivery. You should have that dialogue. You should kind of self-analyze, read a page of the book of one's own life and, and look within oneself with these types of things. So I think about that all the time. <laughs> I try yeah, to. That, that I couldn't agree more. Well, Dennis, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I've, I've been wanting to to sit down with you and have this conversation for a long time. So, Well, I, I hope it's successful. I hope things I've said, maybe, maybe, I either agreed with you or sparked something in you, <laughs> etc. No, I, I absorb a little bit from 
everyone I talk to, and even just doing this project thus far, every conversation I have with everyone, I can't help but have the face and the voice of each person who I've spoken to previously and lessons they've given me and things that they've shared with me. And I can't help but try to reverberate, you know, the wisdoms that are imparted on me or the approaches and the open-mindedness that I've been able to gain. So, you know, I, I appreciate being able to talk to you because you're someone who definitely has really listened to a great deal of people and has really opened your mind up to really hear and see the sides of a lot of things. And above all else, I think, like what I said in the beginning, you've managed to find the wisdom in bad situations and the meaning in those things. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And it might be one of the most important skills that we can all collectively develop. So I appreciate that. And thank you for being my friend. Well, thank you for being my friend and listening to me. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, the wisdom doesn't start, stop here. I'm, I'm sure you'll have a lot more to share with me. Oh, absolutely. So thank you. You're welcome.